Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, the privilege of your time, the opportunity to um, express a, a point of view, sign an executive order, and uh, take some questions. I think it's self-evident to anybody who's been paying any attention about the state of California that we've been suffering and struggling through uh, simultaneous crises. Uh, and as a consequence, we've been challenged as a state uh, in ways that, frankly, we haven't been in quite some time. Of all the simultaneous crises that we face as a state, and I would argue as a nation, uh, and for that matter, uh, from a global perspective, none is more impactful, none is more forceful uh, than the issue of the climate crisis. And that's exactly what we're advancing here today, uh, is a strategy to address that crisis head on, to be as bold as the problem is big, to recognize and reconcile the fact that we have agency, that we can shape this debate, we can shape our future, that we're not just victims of fate. And I make that point to make this point. Uh, a lot of us are anxious, a lot of us are feeling deep uh, stress and anxiety about our future. Uh, I heard a pundit the other day describe California in the last month as uh, a nature hike through the book of Revelations. Uh, and that's self-evident to anyone living out here uh, that is struggling uh, with the heat as we're heating up, struggling uh, with air quality as we're choking up, uh, and struggling with the reality of some 3.7 million acres of forested land in this state uh, that has burnt up. We are experiencing unprecedented weather. August, the hottest recorded uh, month in California history, one of the hottest recorded temperatures in the history of our planet. Uh, just a few weeks back down in Death Valley, 130 degrees. Uh, reference now, not just heat in the state, but now reference of heat dome throughout the Western United States, impacting our energy, impacting uh, our capacity uh, to deliver the people of this state. Uh, and so as a consequence, we have to deliver more than platitudes. We have to deliver more uh, than proposals and promises uh, well into the future. Uh, we've got to deliver uh, in the application of our ideals. We've set ambitious goals in the state of California. I don't know uh, any other state in this country uh, that's been more forceful and forthright in establishing and anchoring a consciousness around climate change, uh, a willingness to begin the process, the hard work of decarbonizing, detoxifying uh, our economy. Uh, but goals are nothing more than dreams with deadlines. We have an obligation to implement those goals, to apply policy, to accelerate uh, our ideals, and to advance our cause. Uh, some would refer to this nothing more than being in the how business. How do you actually achieve substantial reduction in greenhouse gas emissions? How do you significantly reduce emissions uh, in sectors of the economy that have stubbornly grown and not decreased? And today, uh, we are advancing just that, particularly in the area of transportation. The transportation sector in the state of California represents over 50 percent of all of the emissions, 41 percent directly uh, related to vehicles, uh, 11 percent related to the production of uh, petroleum fuels. As a consequence, when we are looking to achieve our audacious goals to get to 100 percent, uh, uh, carbon-free economy by 2045, uh, we can't get there unless we accelerate our efforts in the transportation sector, unless we recognize and reconcile the fact uh, that transportation sector, we have seen an actual increase, modest though it may be, an increase in total emissions while we've seen a decrease in other sectors. We can't continue down this path if we're going to achieve our audacious goals. And as a consequence today, uh, we are marking a new course. Uh, we are setting a new marker. We are advancing the cause with the support uh, of the California Air Resources Board to once again lead not only this nation, uh, but in many respects lead the world in terms of establishing a framework where we can accelerate innovation, uh, we can accelerate adaptation uh, and adoption, uh, and we can in turn uh, grow the economic pie here in the state of California, bringing more and more Californians along. And we'll do that by setting forth a goal, firm goal, that by 2035, in the next 15 years, we will eliminate in the state of California the sales of internal combustion engines. We will move forward to green 
and decarbonize our vehicle fleet here in the state of California. As a consequence, substantially reducing greenhouse gas emissions as well as oxide nitrogen, meaning NOx emissions here in the state of California. In so doing, we'll improve air quality uh, as well as improve the economic climate here in the state of California. Let me make the case. Currently today, the state has 34 manufacturers of electric vehicles. No state in America comes close. This state represents just shy of 50% of all the electric vehicle purchases in the United States of America. We have, by one estimate, uh, close to three quarters of a million electric vehicles uh, in the state of California, 726,000 at last count. No state comes close. Our second largest export, rather, in the state of California are electric vehicles. Those 34 manufacturers represent close, those publicly traded manufacturers represent close to one half a trillion dollars of market capitalization, some $500 billion. This is an economic opportunity, the opportunity to transform our economy across sectors, the opportunity to accelerate innovation and the entrepreneurial spirit, the opportunity to bring more companies here into the state of California, creating more jobs. And we talk about creating more jobs. Let's just set forth some facts that are in evidence here in the state of California. Currently today, green collar jobs, green tech jobs, green jobs broadly defined, represent a five fold increase uh, over total number of jobs currently, uh, those employed in the fossil fuel industry, meaning five to one green jobs outpace fossil fuel jobs here in the state of California already today. The opportunity is limitless for the state of California to compete, not only nationally, but to compete globally. This is the next big global industry, and California wants to dominate it, and that's in detoxifying, decarbonizing our transportation fleets. And so today, California is making a big, bold move in that direction through an executive order that I will sign in a moment, the codification of that effort the California Air Resources Board. You'll hear from Mary Nichols, the chair of the California Air Resources Board, on her efforts to date and her desire to move forward with the spirit and the letter of this executive order. I want to thank, in particular, a number of manufacturers, automobile manufacturers, uh, that get it and are starting to get it done, led by Bill Ford and Ford. Uh, they have been a leader in this space. Uh, they're not a laggard. And they're not willing to just suffer the fate of, uh, of a future of dirtier air, dirtier water, uh, and more climate disruption. Uh, they want to lead, and they are leading with innovation uh, and an entrepreneurial mindset uh, that's leading to more customer choice, that's leading to new technological, technological advancements, and allow them to be on the vanguard of leadership, not just in the United States as a manufacturer, but around the rest of the world. Because one thing we know, the trends are in the direction of zero emission vehicles. The trends are in the direction globally in zero emission vehicles. No less than 15 countries from China and India and Israel and Germany, the United Kingdom, have already established benchmark goals in terms of zero emission vehicle fleets. If you're an American manufacturer, how can you compete globally unless you're in that business? unless you're pushing the boundaries of innovation, unless you're encouraging that same mindset that we are trying to advance here in the state of California. We believe what we are doing here today will substantially enhance and advance the economic competitiveness of American manufacturers, American automobile manufacturers. Bill Ford gets it. Partners that he was able to bring along, Volvo, BMW, and those, Honda, and others, they get it. There are some automobile manufacturers that don't, uh, and they're pushing back against California's leadership, have been in the past, uh, and they're on the wrong side of history. And they'll have to recover economically, uh, not just recover in terms of being able to look their kids and their grandkids in the eye and said that they did the right thing, because at the moment, they haven't. 
And so I just want to acknowledge excellence. I want to acknowledge leaders. And I want to acknowledge those automobile manufacturers that have aligned to California's high vehicle emission standards, to our tailpipe standards, uh, and that are pushing the boundaries of innovation and are helping us collectively support the goals that not only we're trying to advance here today, but more broadly that we've been advancing for decades here in the state of California. Don't forget, it was in 1967 that the state of California led the nation in tailpipe emission standards. It was in 1970, working with Republican President Richard Nixon, that the Clean Air Act was advanced. Republicans, not just Democrats, have led in this space historically. This has not been a partisan issue. Unfortunately, it's become a partisan issue. We have people that are in denial about science, denial about facts. In California, we want to lead with science. We want to address the issue of the facts that are easily observed, the evidence that is abundant as it relates to the hots getting hotter, the dries getting drier, the atmospheric rivers where the wets are getting wetter. We recognize something big has happened globally as it relates to climate change. And we want to take responsibility for leading. We are profoundly impacted by this reality, but we also recognize as the world's fifth largest economy, as the largest economy in the United States of America, as a global leader in innovation and technology, that we have the tools, we have the capacity, not only to lead, but to punch above our weight and to enliven people all across this country and around the rest of the globe to follow and to be partners in this collective cause. We saw that with the Clean Car Promise. We saw that uh, with the U.S. Climate Alliance, some 24 governors, bipartisan alliance of governors representing 55 percent of the population of the United States of America, locking arms in terms of our collective efforts to decarbonize our economy. We have the power and we have the privilege of leaders like Mary Nichols uh, that have led and demonstrated the capacity to deliver on what we promote, to deliver on what we promise in a way that grows our economic output, that creates opportunities for people who have been locked out of the old 19th century mindset and the old fossil fuel economy. If you want to reduce asthma, if you want to mitigate the rise of sea level, if you want to mitigate the loss of ice sheets around the globe, then this is a policy for other states to follow, for other states and nations to emulate. If you care about your kids and your grandkids, if you care about disadvantaged communities, you care about seniors, you care about rural communities, you care about inner city communities that have been underserved uh, by our fossil fuel economy, then you care about the core construct that we're advancing here in this executive order. And so I'm very proud to have the privilege of growing up in this great state, the Golden State. Uh, we believe the future happens here first. We are in every way, shape, or form. We believe America's coming attraction, not just in terms of the impacts of climate change, but our resolve to address the impacts of climate change and lead in addressing these issues in a more sustainable way, in a more regenerative mindset, which is foundational to the fate and future of not just the people in this state, but our nation and the planet. And so I couldn't be more proud today to be able to sign this executive order uh, moving forward uh, by not denying people the ability to keep their cars after 15 years, you can still keep your internal combustion engine car. You can still have a market for used cars. You can still trade and transfer those cars. We're not taking anything away. We're providing an abundance of new choices and new technology, being agnostic about how we get to zero emissions, but being committed to getting to zero emissions by 2035. Final two points. I want to applaud California Air Resources Board uh, just recently. And this deserves enormous amount of attention, and I want to highlight it yet again. They did just this for large, heavy-duty trucks here in the state of California. By 2045, heavy-duty trucks will have similar uh, requirement in terms of manufacture and sales. It was interesting, wasn't it, that just yesterday, weeks after, California led in that space. Walmart came out and said, you are going to best California, and we are going to produce only zero emission truck fleet by 2040. That's the spirit of innovation. That's the spirit of partnership. This is not just about government. This is about the private sector and the entrepreneurial mindset of some of the biggest companies in the world 
that get it and want to get it done as well. Tesla yesterday, just coincidentally, advancing new innovation in batteries, bringing down the cost of batteries, extending not only the life of the batteries, but the range of the batteries. You're seeing innovation across the spectrum in this place. You're seeing price parity within the next few years of electric vehicles with traditional internal combustion vehicles. But the difference is you don't have to pay any money at the pump. The difference is with a zero emission vehicle, you have lower maintenance costs. You have lower operating costs. So if you want to protect disadvantaged communities, impoverished communities, then pull away from the gas pumps. Let us no longer be victims of geopolitical dictators that manipulate global supply chains and global markets as it relates to the petrol politics that have become so much part of our lives. Let's disabuse ourselves that that has to be our fate, that has to be our future. It simply does not. Let us lead again California in a cleaner, brighter, uh, more resilient future. And so I'm very enthusiastic about this. I'm not naive that not everybody is going to join hands on this. But one thing I know, this is the trend line that will become a headline around the rest of the world. And we're not just going to be in the back of this bus. We're going to be leading once again. We're going to be driving this accelerated change. Good policy means accelerating technology and accelerating innovation. Innovation. That's California's game. We do it better than anybody else. And so I want to just thank not only Mary, who's going to speak here in just a moment, but I want to thank our large team uh, of environmental leaders, not just environmental stewards, uh, led uh, by Jared Bloomfeld, EPA here in the state of California, Wade Crowfoot, uh, leading a resource agency, David Hotchild at California uh, Energy Commission, uh, representatives of the Public Utilities Commission, uh, and our own co-chair uh, of our Economic and Workforce Task Force, uh, and that's Tom Steyer, uh, an international leader on climate change and someone that's taken on some of the dirty fossil fuel interests head on and won, proving that we can win, proving we can get this done. And so thank them. Uh, and my entire executive team, uh, my chief of staff, Ann O'Leary, Ana Montesantos, and others uh, that helped organize the core principles that we're setting forth uh, in this executive order. Final point. We also recognize that it's not just about demand, though demand is foundational. We also have to look at supply. And none of us are naive in the state of California uh, as a fossil fuel production state that we need to focus on a just transition, a just transition, to make sure those that are impacted by this transition are included in the new economic opportunities. And so we are in that process. That process is underway. Two very significant studies are coming out, first draft, November 1st, in terms of advancing and accelerating that just transition. We have rulemaking uh, with our regulatory agency, CalGEM, that's taking shape uh, by the end of this calendar year as it relates to health and safety standards, buffer zones, as it relates to production and the health impacts uh, these production facilities have on communities uh, that are vulnerable. And we have a commitment to phase out uh, fracking here in the state of California. Pursuant to this executive order, uh, we will be directing and working very specifically uh, on a legislative strategy to begin the phase out formally uh, of fracking here in the state. Uh, and that is a commitment, a firm commitment from this administration codified in this executive order that will be advanced January in the new legislative session uh, to advance that cause as well. So all those studies will be done in the next number of weeks and months. Requirements in this executive order to take those studies and actualize them, make them real by July 1st of next year, a legislative agenda uh, to compel some fundamental change to provide more flexibility and more authority for the executive branch to actually deliver on a lot of these fronts, and the work of the California Air Resources Board to continue uh, their leadership uh, at a global level. So with that, a global leader, uh, one of the best and certainly the brightest uh, environmental leader uh, in arguably one of the best and brightest in our nation's history. I know that may sound um, hyperbolic, 
Uh, it may sound almost patronizing when I'm standing next to her, uh, Mary Nichols, because, you know, people tend to be flowery in their introductions. But um, I'm saying this soberly with a deep realization um, of the facts. Uh, and Mary's about to move uh, into retirement. Uh, but I cannot express how proud I am that she's standing here uh, by our side, 40 million Californians' side, at this pivotal moment in our nation and our world's history to once again lead in terms of advancing a cause that should unite all of us as Americans with the spirit of the moment of leadership uh, that is fundamental uh, in terms of shaping the future that we all want. And so with that, Chair of the California Air Resources Board, Mary Nichols. <laughs> I'm not as tall as the governor. Do I need to I take it off? There we go. Um, thank you, Governor. And um, I uh, am proud to be here today on behalf of uh, all of the people who worked to put this executive order together. Uh, the job of uh, trying to forestall the worst of climate change and to deal with the reality of it that's already in front of us is everybody's work. Uh, state government, for sure, all of the agencies, cities, nonprofit groups, everybody, businesses, wherever they are, people are facing the reality of what climate change is doing to us, the added burden that it puts on people who are exposed to the COVID virus. Uh, it's been a very hard time uh, for everybody, really, in our state. And that's one reason why I could not be prouder that when the governor decided, after taking a look at some of the worst of the fires, that we had to do more as a state government to try to tackle this problem and to use the brains and the powers that we had to uh, make a bigger difference, uh, he turned to uh, CARB and we were ready. Uh, the people who work for my agency, uh, engineers, scientists, lawyers, of course, um, and lots of just plain smart people who uh, get up every day, but now from their own homes, sometimes their bedrooms or their studies, are working to try to figure out how we can uh, deal with the persistence of smog that makes people sick and also at the same time try to get ahead of this escalating climate problem. We have uh, in our agency a tremendous record going back to the late 60s of having seen what technology could do and particularly with a focus on the kinds of technology that affect mobility because California is, as the governor was saying, a state that's all about mobility. I myself did not have the opportunity to grow up in California. I moved here as an adult. My kids are native Californians, so they can take it for granted. But I can never forget uh, what an amazing revelation it was to come to this place and to be able to live in a climate uh, which means weather, but it means more than that because it's a social and economic climate of innovation and openness. Uh, it, is what brought me here, and it's what brought so many other people here. And so we know we have an obligation to keep on working to clean up the air and to make it as clean as it can be and to be ahead of the curve when it comes to technologies, knowing where industry can go, where we can help them to go, maybe sometimes with a push, but always by setting a standard that's based on technology and science that then the private sector and the consumers can step up and embrace. So that's what we're doing here with a executive order that will transform the California transportation uh, picture completely. Uh, in 15 years, it will have dramatically reduced the emissions from this industry and it brought in a whole new generation of cleaner, more efficient vehicles that are exactly the kind of vehicles that people around the world want. 
and we get to be at the head of the line of places that will be getting them because uh, we've had the vision, the leadership of our governor, uh, and, uh, and the opportunity because of our states, uh, in spite of everything, our ability and willingness to step up and take bold action. So uh, I really want to thank the governor for having given us the direction uh, to help us to implement this um, executive order. And I just uh, could not be prouder personally of uh, my agency and the people that I work with for being ready when the call came to step forward with some language and um, some ideas which we believe are going to actually make this work. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, I'll let you get on to signing it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mary. And, uh, you know, so look, if I can just sum this up, I, I recognize, and I think a lot of us do, that there's a little bit of gold, gold fatigue uh, as it relates to climate policy. And, and we were hesitant to establish even more goals. Uh, we are now committing ourselves to implementing those goals. Uh, we have gone from the what to the why. And now we need to focus on the how business. And so that's the big announcement today uh, is a bold step forward uh, to target uh, the number one sector of our economy in terms of emissions. And that is in our transportation sector uh, and to encourage other states to take similar leadership and this nation uh, to move forward boldly to do exactly the same. We want more choice. We want more competition. Uh, we want more innovation. We want more economic growth. We want more inclusion in terms of those policies. We want cleaner air, cleaner water. We want to reduce health care costs. Uh, and we want to increase our manufacturing base and our exports. That's what we believe we are significantly advancing here today. With that, though, we advance nothing if we don't, Mary, advance to the cause that brought us here, and that's signing this executive order. I'm just a little worried. I want it signed. Let's say, uh, all this means nothing unless we sign it. So why don't we, why don't sure. we go back there? And we're we're going we're gonna to pick the Ford only because we're appreciating Bill Ford's leadership. I think yeah. that they were, yeah. Everybody come on up. This is a slightly strange place to sign something. I don't know if a governor's ever signed on a car that you've read before. Beautiful car. With that, happy to take any questions. Where are we? Oh, there we are. Thank you, Governor. I'm Dustin Gardner from the San Francisco Chronicle, and I'll be asking questions on behalf of the press corps. Um, several people have asked about your conversations with automakers. Manufacturers have long been concerned about the prospect of having to make one car for California and another car for the rest of the country. What sort of reaction do you anticipate from them? Well, we have six car companies, some of the largest manufacturers in the world that happen to be American automobile manufacturers that have voluntarily agreed to join California in our efforts to maintain the Obama era vehicle emissions and tailpipe emissions standards, regardless of the efforts by the Trump administration to roll them back. That says everything you need to know. And that's a direct answer to your question. These companies get it and they're getting it done by putting billions and billions of dollars of investment in research and development because they recognize the trend lines around the rest of the world. They recognize that they're not going to be able to compete on a global scale unless they're creating cars that people want and countries are demanding. And so that's why we believe this only advances that cause, creates clarity, creates some certainty 
It's a 15-year process, uh, which creates the opportunity to bring down costs, advance innovation, uh, and create an opportunity for these manufacturers to become, uh, once again, best in class from a globally competitive perspective. Next question from Alejandro Lazo, Wall Street Journal. Why are you pursuing this zero emissions policy through executive order versus through passing legislation? Could this approach possibly lead to more legal challenges? Well, we're moving forward expeditiously because this moment demands leadership. It demands movement. The California Air Resources Board and its well-established uh, standards of responsibility and well-established uh, framework of constitutional authority uh, will advance the next steps in this effort, similarly to what they just did on the clean truck mandate. Uh, it is tried and true, well-established in the rule of law, uh, and uh, an effort uh, that advanced under the clean truck rules that is also now being replicated by 15 other states, at least committed uh, uh, replication of 15 other states. So we believe in the power of emulation. We believe successful policy leaves clues, and we believe the adaptation and adoption uh, in other states uh, is inevitable. We have quite a few questions about fracking and oil drilling permits. Uh, you, you referred to possibly working with the legislature to take some action there to end fracking. Do you not have that, a pow that power now through executive order? Why do you not do that now if you have that ability? Well, we simply don't have that authority. That's why we need the legislature to approve it. We've put in this executive order specific timeline uh, in terms of transitioning and ending fracking in the state of California. I want to put fracking in perspective. It's less than 2 percent of the production in the state of California. It is substantive, but it also is symbolic. We have to do more on the demand side, and that's why today we think we've made a bold and big step in advancing that cause. We also have advanced the cause a number of months ago to take a scientific approach to analyze, and this is what we believe. We believe in science, not antidote, not opinion. We believe in science, We're driven by science as it relates to our health policies and our response to COVID, and as it relates to climate and climate change, uh, we believe in science-based rulemaking. And that rulemaking is underway uh, through CalGEM, which is the regulatory agency in this space, uh, to put in place a framework around health and safety standards as well, and the possibility of mitigation zones, buffer zones, uh, to advance the cause of public health and safety as well, in addition to the efforts around fracking. Next question from Lauren Sumner, uh, NPR News. Given that electric cars are still a small share of the market, what incentives do you plan to put in place to encourage Californians to buy EVs? Well, again, we're 50% we're of the market in the United States, so the adaptation is significant in this state. It's grown exponentially over the last number of years. Uh, more models, more choice for consumers coming out. The cost beginning to climb. We're just a few years away from parity. We believe this policy, 15 years hence, will accelerate uh, the adaptation of new technologies, uh, which will be breakthrough technologies, bringing down costs, increasing choice, creating economic opportunities. And so we'll continue uh, the tried and true policies in the state to incentivize uh, through credits, uh, incentivize through vouchers and rebates, uh, efforts to advance not just, again, electric vehicles in the state, but zero emission vehicles. We are not uh, wedded to one particular technology. Uh, we just want to fundamentally reconcile the fact we're no longer living in the 19th century and we don't need to drill things, extract things in order to advance uh, our economic uh, goals and advance our mobility needs. Uh, building on that question about electric vehicle rebates, the current budget cuts funding for rebates. Why is that and what sort of uh, strategy do you have in mind for a new rebate structure? Yeah, we've been struggling, as everybody knows, with a $54.3 billion shortfall, simply without precedent to go from a $6.6 .6 billion projected surplus uh, just a few months ago uh, to an unprecedented shortfall uh, a few months later. And as a consequence, uh, we've had to review our commitments across the spectrum. But I can assure you this, uh, we are committed uh, to not just the short term, uh, but the medium and long term in achieving these goals in a way that incentivizes adoption and adaptation. Uh, and you'll be seeing a lot more in this space uh, in my January budget. And we look forward now that we're getting some stability back in the economy uh, to more uh, robust 
results from our cap and trade auctions, which will also aid and advance these efforts. The last auction uh, produced much better results than the previous auction, uh, which will also provide more resources to invest in precisely the programs that you're referring to. Next question, Tony Barboza, LA Times. How will California be able to carry out this zero emissions mandate if the Trump administration's revocation of the state's federal emissions waiver holds up in court? I'm going to I'm going to have my <laughs> legal advisor answer that question. Thank you. Um, so uh, we are challenging the interpretation of the law by the Trump administration. We believe the Clean Air Act gives us the authority to set exactly the kinds of standards that we have set since the late 60s. And uh, therefore, we look forward to being able to do that in the future. It's the answer. <laughs> I mean, we'll go to court. We, we're in court. We'll get there eventually. But in the meantime, we continue to lay out the course and gather support. We have more states now than ever who have joined with us. So, you know, we have over half the states in the United States who filed legal briefs supporting California's position here. I don't think Congress wants to amend the Clean Air Act to take away California's leadership role, which we've had since the very beginning. In fact, we see the opposite being the case, that they're increasingly looking to the states and giving us uh, the opportunities to uh, move forward where we can do that ahead of the federal government. And I, I think it's very telling that these six automobile manufacturers have joined that cause. So the question is, who's bidding is the president and the administration doing? If the assertion is they're doing it on behalf of manufacturers, well, why is Volvo and BMW, VW, why is Honda and Ford joining our efforts? Why are they committed to staying the course? Uh, and that is a question uh, that I look forward uh, to being answered uh, by this administration and the incredible vandalism that's been done to the Environmental Protection Agency in the last three and a half years. Next question comes from Nicole Nixon at Cap Radio News. She asks, environmental groups are calling for phasing out electric vehicles by 2030. Why are you sticking with a 2035 timeline? Well, we're doing something no other state has ever done history, and arguably uh, this is the most significant effort of its kind anywhere in the world because it comes uh, with the California Air Resources Board's backing. So uh, forgive us. Uh, we're very proud of this effort and uh, to the extent we need to do more and do better, uh, none of us are ideological. Wilson at the Desert Sun. How, do you, how, how does your executive order and climate initiative address ongoing large oil spills in California spills that release greenhouse gases and harmful air pollution while often generating profits for the polluters. Well, we've been very aggressive in terms of our enforcement. We've substantially invested uh, in CalGEM, uh, put together new guidelines, and new staffing, new requirements, more aggressive oversight, new leadership uh, at CalGEM who's responsible in that space. Uh, and we put together this scientific-based study uh, to look at the impacts of health and safety that will be concluded, uh, the fruits of that effort, at the end of the calendar year, in addition to the two studies on just transition, one that has to do with transportation fleets, the others that have to do with the issues of fossil fuel broadly, not just fracking specifically. Uh, those two studies are backed by $3 million of investment and are being conducted by our own University of California first draft of those studies come out on November 1st. How would this order affect hybrids, plug-in hybrids specifically? That's actually the most popular model of, of EV in the state right now. Would they still be allowed under this order? Yeah, I'll, I'll have Mary who can talk more specifically about makes and models. Yeah, uh, so um, we're transitioning uh, away from hybrids and in the direction of full zero emission, but that's a 15-year process. And in the meantime, for some people, it's a lot more comfortable to try out a hybrid first. But what we're seeing is, as the uh, hybrids get more and more advanced, they become closer and closer to zero emissions. When I first started, the uh, Toyota Prius was the most advanced car anybody had ever seen, and it didn't have a plug. And then eventually, they moved in the direction of having, having a small uh, electric engine. And then people, their customers said, wait a minute, I like driving on electric. I want more, because it improves my fuel economy. So we see this 15-year period 
it as one during which, by the end of it, uh, people will recognize that, uh, yes, they can find a full uh, zero emission vehicle that meets all of their needs. People have asked about affordability uh, for, of these models, for, for especially for low-income buyers. Some of the models you're standing in front of cost $30,000 or more. What um, in the new rebate structure will the state provide to make they're sure there is equity, equity for low-income buyers? Well, I think you uh, heard earlier that um, there was an announcement yesterday from Tesla about things that they're doing to bring the cost of batteries down. The main element in the cost of an electric vehicle is the battery cost. Batteries have been getting both a lot more capable in terms of their range, mileage range, and also uh, more capable of uh, doing it with a smaller volume and, uh, and, and a lower cost. Now, that was just one manufacturer, but there's an arms race going on here. It's an electric race uh, to get to cheaper and more effective batteries, and it's one that uh, manufacturers around the world are competing in because that's the prize, is the zero emission vehicle that's affordable by everybody. And you're gonna be seeing uh, announcements. I, I think there was one actually occurred this morning on the part of Volkswagen, which a couple of years ago we were citing for violations of emission standards with their diesel engines. They've already announced their plans to become a fully electric company, only making electric vehicles. And today they unveiled a new uh, model, which is the first uh, compact SUV that's fully electric. Um, I haven't had a chance to drive one, but I, I know for a price they'd let me put down a reservation. They're, they're, they're ready to sell them. So um, I think you're seeing a really quick transition here, and it's in the direction of affordability. But in addition, I want to say that we aren't just waiting for uh, the price to come down. Many people can't afford a new car, whatever the price is, and the need to place electric vehicles in places where people can utilize them and enjoy the benefits, and the whole community can enjoy the benefits of zero emissions, is important too. So we have programs underway to encourage electric bicycles, electric scooters, used electric vehicles, community share electric vehicles, uh, organizations that will be helping to provide carpooling that's uh, fully zero, and last but not least, our transit agencies, which are now in very sad shape because of the recession, and and which also need to be making the transition to zero emission buses. We need to be working with them directly, and that's just not just CARB, it's CalSTAL, the Transportation Agency, Caltrans, and others who are really working creatively to figure out ways to help more people utilize uh, our transit system. So it's, it's in all of the above. And let me, uh, and I appreciate Mary bringing that up because in the executive order we talk in terms of uh, our streets, we talk bicycle, we talk about transit. Uh, we also call out uh, specifically the work that we've been doing. Mary led on previous administration, led on low carbon fuel standards and the transition of some of our largest refineries in the state of California. I'd point to two examples recently, uh, Phillips 66 and Marathon refineries that are beginning to transition uh, their fuels uh, and their manufacturing facilities. That's happening in real time. That's an extraordinary proof point to the opportunity to transition, create jobs, and do so in a sustainable way. And uh, we specifically in this executive order call out strategies to move away from red tape in that space uh, to a red carpet mentality in terms of securing and encouraging that transition in a much more expeditious manner. But the bottom line is this when it comes to cost. Just consider these two proof points. Just in the last decade, the cost of wind has dropped in half and the cost of solar just in the last decade has dropped 85%. The cost question uh, is dissipating significantly. That gap is beginning to go away. And just in the next few years, you will see price parity in this space uh, with these new cars. And again, our mandate is 15 years hence. Uh, and I think the issue of cost uh, will substantially be, and may I say this uh, intentionally, in our rear view mirror. Last question here, and again, this is from Janet Wilson at the Desert Sun. She asked about steam fracking. Your order addresses hydraulic fracking. Steam fracking is also shown to be a dangerous technique to workers and wildlife. 
Why does your executive order not address this extraction technique? Well, we, we put a moratorium on, on cyclic steam uh, fracking a number of months ago. We have strategies in place uh, that are being advanced specifically by CalJAM on the regulatory side. Uh, but I would be remiss because uh, he is standing to my right not to have the person responsible uh, in this space not answer that question with a little bit more clarity ahead of our Natural Resource Agency, Wade Crowfoot. Thanks, Governor. Well, the governor is absolutely right. Uh, he has made it clear that there is a zero tolerance policy for these uh, inland oil spills uh, that are also called surface expressions. Uh, CalGEM is implementing right now a strengthened rule to ensure these surface expressions don't happen uh, that, that passed in April and is being implemented. Likewise, uh, the governor mentioned that uh, we have placed a moratorium on that high pressure cyclic steam practice that we uh, believe uh, led to the surface expression in Kern County that gained uh, a lot of attention in recent months. So our CalGEM experts are very focused and heeding the governor's very uh, clear direction to us, which is a zero tolerance policy moving forward uh, for these types of oil spills. Is that it? Well, with that, let me thank everybody for the privilege of your time, privilege uh, of being here with Mary Nichols and our entire environmental leadership team, Tom Steyer and others. Uh, and thank you all uh, for this opportunity to explain this executive order and subsequent actions by the California Air Resources Board. But I will conclude by making a point and emphasizing the following. We're just getting started. Uh, we are working on a series of additional executive orders. Uh, we are committed more broadly uh, on the whole spectrum of climate change, to look at energy efficiency, uh, to look at biodiversity, which is an area that often is undervalued uh, and underfocused, uh, and looking at other areas uh, to strengthen uh, our bonds in terms of our commitment and our resolve uh, to advance our low carbon green growth goals to radically change the way we produce and consume energy here in the state of California. Last words, uh, I think it was Plato who said, if there's any hope for the future, those with lanterns will pass them on to others. And I just want to express appreciation. I referenced Ronald Reagan, 1967, and the work that was done in partnership with a Republican president by the name of Richard Nixon, uh, George H.W. Bush advancing cap and trade to deal with acid rain, a uh, Republican governor by the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, putting into effect the largest cap and trade program, the only fully functioning cap and trade program in the United States of America, uh, Governor Davis that actually advanced a lot of environmental goals that often is overlooked, and of course, of course, uh, Governor Jerry Brown, uh, who really set the bar, and not only leadership here within the state and across the United States, but globally. That MOU under two, 220 jurisdictions representing 43% of the global economy signed the equivalent of the Paris Accord, doubling down on their commitment and our commitment uh, to fill the void of national leadership as it relates to climate change. And as a governor of a state whose population is larger than 163 nations of the 196 that signed those Paris Accords, uh, I say amen and thank you uh, to Governor Brown's leadership. Look forward to doing a lot more uh, and sharing those efforts with you in the near term. Thank you all very, very much.